Thank you, thank you. And uh, I'm really happy that you all came out, especially on such short notice. Uh, Aaron uh, Jones, we hired in August of this past year uh, as the legislative researcher for the project that we're going to talk to you about. Uh, and uh, the short notice actually uh, is uh, partly because we're on a fast track on this bill. Uh, and uh, Senator Elliott introduced a bill for the racial impact statement uh, bill uh, that requires uh, a, a racial impact statement on any bill that's introduced uh, in the legislature that addresses punishments and that it increases or affects punishments at all. So if it's a bill that will add a fine or address probation, the role, more time, less time, they have to have a racial impact so they can get this bill passed. And we thought we had a little more time because the session's not over until April 19th. This is my first time uh, uh, being the behind the scenes organizing kind of person uh, as well as uh, Aaron's first time. So we kind of were taking our lead from Joyce Elliott, so Elliott She's juggling. And plus, I think this is how the legislature works. Legislation works. Legislature works. They kind of pop things up like they put it on the hearing for Thursday, late, probably on the 28th, because we didn't learn about it until the 29th. So, of this month, last week. So, Joyce also wanted us to have meetings with as many community people as we could. By the end of March, well, hey, see all kinds of friends. Uh, and I've only been to Little Rock since 2004, Arkansas. But anyway, so I wanted to put this uh, on your agenda because we, uh, the legislative session is over April 19th. Uh, and so we need to get people uh, advised about it. But what we're here for, we're not just here to talk to you. We're here to asking you to step into action. And so we want you to leave here. Hopefully you'll be uh, motivated to pick up the phone tomorrow and call legislators and say we want you to support this bill. So, you know, we came here for you to encourage you, hopefully, to take some action. Because we need legislators to know what we that we think this bill is important. If you do, if you don't, then you know, then that's okay. And, you know, everybody has their own decisions to make. But let me give you a little bit of background <coughs> about the a racial impact statement. I'll give you some background about it. I'll talk a little bit about Arkansas disparities, <coughs> and then Aaron will talk to you a little bit about other states that have uh, this bill, or this kind of legislation. So, uh, the state racial impact legislation is, uh, is that the bill? No, I didn't. Oh, we have the bill, I didn't know if you were. So you, you use an I meet with so fast. Ain't that like somebody? Anyway, uh, stay focused on my stuff, please. You know, because this is important. I don't want you to get defocused. Uh, so the racial impact legislation uh, basically is very simple. Uh, and what, it, what we're doing, and it came out of our steering committee that Judge Ross mentioned to me, she's on the steering committee. And uh, what the steering committee did at first meeting in June of 2011, uh, Joyce Elliott was there, and we were just brainstorming as a whole committee, you know, about the disparities in the Arkansas uh, just criminal justice system. And uh, Joyce Elliott said, well, I think what we ought to do is we ought to have a racial impact statement legislation. And so I got busy. I was talking to a funder about the uh, possibility of funding our whole research project, which I'll tell you a tiny bit about. And I just happened to mention, I wasn't looking for money for this project. I just happened to mention it because it was right after the steering committee meeting. And I was all excited about it. And uh, the uh, uh, funder said, oh, that's very 
very interesting and something fun to me. Uh, so that's how we were able to hire Aaron and do you know these kinds of visits and that kind of thing. So why did we even form this project? I started. I was the founding director of, of UALR's Institute on Race and Ethnicity, as you know, and when I first got there. Uh, in fact, in part of the hiring process, the, I was asked by the chancellor and the committee, well, what would be your first big research project? And my response was, criminal disparity in the criminal punishment system. I have a background in that, in the sense that since I graduated law school uh, in 78, so I'm telling you how old I am, but not how old I am, really, but you can kind of figure out closely. Uh, but you can also look at my gray hair, right? No. So I'm pretty much gray hair. I'm just 25. But anyway, I started uh, at the Department of Justice Civil Rights Division in a section called Special Litigation that focused on the rights of the institutionalized. And so I was an attorney that went and we sued or joined in lawsuits uh, that prisoners about prisoners' conditions. <coughs> and so what struck me initially was you go into these prisons all over the country and you see so many of us in there, right? And so that just didn't seem right to me. I've never been one to believe that somehow we're just more criminal than anybody else, right? And so that struck me and I did that for a number of years and everywhere you went except on the Southwest where you go into the prisons and you see more of us yeah, you know, <coughs> in the Southwest percentage-wise, but then you see a whole bunch of Native Americans and Latinos, again, disproportionate. So people of color more generally. <coughs> and so then <coughs> in my work, I began to look at data and statistics and saw the disparity all over the country. It's a national problem. This is not just an Arkansas problem. And Aaron will talk to you just a tiny bit about Iowa, uh, as well as a couple of other states. So when I started, I said, well, you know, to me, that's the first good research project to just find out because we can see the experiment. We see that 42% of those incarcerated in the state of Arkansas are African-American men. We see that 60% of those on death row in Arkansas are African-American men. African-American men make up less than the of the population. That by itself shocks me, but we've got people non-believers who believe that African American men are just so violent and murderous and all of that. So we have another fact to add to the pot, which is <coughs> there was a study done in the a an AS Judicial Circuit, which is uh, it's in this piece here, uh, Nevada, Hempstead, and a couple of other counties, Miller, Nevada, Hempstead, and Lafayette counties. And that study showed that African American men were more likely than white men similarly situated, which means similar background, similar type of crime. You know, so it's not like you're looking at somebody who had only one arrest compared to somebody who had 20. Similarities down the line. Uh, and that only black men got, got the death penalty and only for the murders of whites. So that we have that study that shows that at least there's <coughs> evidence in those counties. And I would, I'm not sure they would be an exception. I'll put it that way. I'm not open mind on our research. But this data to show that at least in those four counties, there's something amiss. <coughs> that it is apparently from the data, we could call it discriminatory. Uh, so one of the things that happens, and it's happened to me all these years that I've been working on this issue, is a lot of times people push back because they don't want to deal with crime. They, you know, people have this attitude that somehow, well, they do crime at the time. Well, my view is, and it's sort of like, I don't know how many of you uh, uh, read Angela Davis' book or her James Baldwin's piece that says if they come for me in the morning. And so my view is, we can't allow discrimination at any level. And we can't allow anyone, regardless of what they have done or not done, to be discriminated against. Because if we allow that at this level, then what are we doing? We're allowing it and making it continually possible and continuing, because we do know it's, it, has, it's, it continues to exist in many levels, even 
not just in the criminal punishment system. So to me, we have to uh, speak out for that reason. The other reason is, and this is something that Senator Elliott talks about, but all of us know is, this is destroying our communities and our families. And that when we allow people to be treated like that in our communities and be taken out of our communities, it disrupts our whole families and it disrupts our communities. And we are just going to do the, uh, we're doing all sentencing. So I gave you the data on the death penalty only because it to me is stark. But it also is, as I indicated, 42% of those locked up or black men. And they are just locked up for homicides. They're locked up for drugs. They're locked up for burglary. They're locked up. So at all these levels. And the other thing is people who are locked up are going to what? They're going to come out. Right? For the most part, except for those who are on death row or those who are life without parole or life, they come back to our communities. So that within that system, we have to strike to me and require a uh, fairness. And that's what this bill does. Uh, the racial impact statement as when we were in, we, we've been in Harrison, Arkansas, uh, Fort Smith, and Jonesboro. And what we all have come out with at all of those meetings is we want to, this bill is really about fairness. You know, one guy in uh, uh, Harrison, uh, so when we, we, when we got started organizing in Harrison, the woman who was organizing said, well, you know, we may have some plan people here. And I said, well, that's fine, because we're trying to educate, right? I was sitting there and asked for credentials, you know, do you belong to this group or that group? We didn't stand at the back and say, what group do you all belong to, right? So I told them that was fine. Well, nobody could go with their roles. And we were talking, and we could, just like we're going to do here, after we make our presentation, uh, we're going to open it for uh, discussion. And when we open it for discussion, this guy raised his hand and he says, talking about letting them out of prison. And he said, no, 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 we're not talking about letting them out of prison. So we explain what the bill is about. Now, why is that important? I'm not saying that because I want you to think, oh, OK, this is a trans person. I don't know what they mean. But I do know that he asked a question that I bet you half those folk in that room wanted to ask. So for me, he was a blessing as opposed to a detractor. Because he got at a point that I'm sure some of them were worried about. Does this legislation actually mean that we are going to be in quote soft on crime? No. What this legislation would require is our legislators knowing that whether or not a bill is going to have a disparate effect on communities of color. So that if the research shows that it does, then the legislator has to go back to the drawing board and figure out, can you do what you wanted to do, your, your public safety concern? We're assuming you didn't want to lock up only black and brown people. We assume that, right? Whether the assumption is correct or not, we're saying to them, even with your best intention, not intending the result of disparate uh, 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 impact on communities of color, that in fact you go back to the drawing board and see what your, if your public safety concern can be addressed with a bill that doesn't have a disparate impact. Okay. The last thing I want to say in terms of disparate impact is we all know about the methamphetamine crack powder cocaine. One of the things that this bill will do, if passed, is it will say you have to really look at are we punishing the same drug the same way? Uh, again, this unintended consequence, which I argue that in 86 it was an intended consequence on our communities by some uh, But an unintended consequence so we look at the methamphetamine statute and crack powder cocaine statutes in Arkansas. They did, a few years ago, they, uh, the legislature went in to reduce, to make, to make equal the punishments for cocaine and methamphetamine because there was a disparity. They initially had been really hard on methamphetamine, right? And so they wanted to make it more equal. But they made it equal to powder cocaine. And they left the higher punishment.
punishments for crack cocaine. So this bill would have said, when you go back in, you can't, you have to explain why, in fact, you're treating the same drug differently. Because all of the experts that testified at the Sentencing Commission in the federal government, federal Sentencing Commission, the Federal Sentencing Commission voted unanimously several times to equalize the sentencing between crack powder and cocaine. It wasn't until 2010 that Congress acted on that. And this bill was, as I said, introduced in 1986, was passed in 1986. And the Congress acted in 2010, but they still didn't equalize it. They, instead of being 100 to 1, that means that if you had powder cocaine, you'd have to have 100 times more powder cocaine than crack cocaine, than a person with crack cocaine in order to get the same sentence, right? So now it's 18 to 1. Still a disparity, it's still wrong, but it's shrinking. And maybe a continuing effort in the national arena, it will get to be but those, what, what people say, and we had Mark Mao here, uh, who we had some video, but it worked well without the video. We did the video in Jonesboro, and we didn't do it in Fort Smith, and it actually, to us, worked better without the video, because you know, people like looking at the video. Uh, and, but Mark Mao, who is the director of the Sentencing Project, has been so for a number of years, came here, and uh, we, we presented in front of the Legislative Black Caucus, as well as we had into, uh, Harrison, uh, along with uh, uh, a representative from Iowa, uh, and which Aaron will talk a tiny bit about. And then we had a luncheon meeting in Little Rock. And what Mark Mauer talks about is the whole, this is a national issue, a national problem, and that racial impact statement legislation is a way of getting ahead of the problem with your past. It's a way of people not being able to hide behind who I didn't know. Okay, and I'm just saying, being candid about it. Who I didn't know. It's, it avoids the who's issue, right? So that those who are well meaning and well intended will stop it there and say, look, we've got to figure out how else to do this so that we aren't continuing to send more black and brown people to prison. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Aaron, and then we'll open it up for discussion and talk, and then we'll end with uh, our preview. So when I first started researching about racial impact legislation, I had no clue what it was, nor had I ever heard of it before. But in my research, I found out about Representative Wayne Ford and Representative, or not Representative, but Mark Mauer, who's the director of the Sixteen Project in D.C. And I found out that Wayne Ford, who was from Iowa, he, his, he was the first state senator in the nation to actually introduce racial impact statement legislation, which in his state, they called it minority impact statement legislation. And minority in Iowa contains, or it covers the disabled, it covers women, as well as minor racial minorities. But they passed minority impact statement for the first time in, back in 2007. And since then, uh, I'm sure y'all are aware of the stand your ground law and the issue that's going on in Florida with Trayvon Martin. In Iowa, they tried to pass the stand your ground law a couple of years ago, but because of this bill that Representative Wayne Ford passed back in 2007, this bill is currently uh, just in a state of limbo. It's not going anywhere because people, after they have reviewed the racial impact of this bill, they saw that, okay, well, it's probably gonna have a disproportionate effect, it will probably disproportionately, disproportionately affect minorities and people of color more so than our counterparts, Caucasians and what have you. And Iowa is a very important st state only because it is the fifth whitest state and because when Representative Wayne Ford passed it, he was the only city African American in the state legislature. So he will tell you that he kind of used that to his advantage and it had it worked. Then Iowa is also number one in the nation for militia and you know they're number one for militia I meaning they have their gun loving people that stand your ground bill is still in the state of limbo because of the minority impact statement that was passed back in 2007. And also just the, the nature of an impact statement, it's not something that is made in congressmen or state legislatures or even U.S. legislatures. Uh, we, we use environmental impact statements as well as fiscal impact statements. So anytime any one of y'all, if you want to create a bill, before you have that bill passed, you have to give a fiscal impact statement 
over this bill. So we have to know where's the money coming from to pay for it and how much will this bill cost and will it incur any more, any more funds. As well as with the environmental impact statement, if you want to have a bill and you want to say create, you want to create a subdivision for shopping, you have to give, you have to say, okay, well, in creating this, using this specific area, we'll have to cut down X amount of trees, you know, we'll have to provide X amount of sewer pipelines to it, and you just have to kind of tell what the damage could be done to the environment around it. And also, and also, uh, Representative Wayne Corey, when he came down here, he brought his assistant, Dennis Henderson, who was, who was an ex-offender who had served 25 years. And prior to him meeting us back in March 4th, he had just been out of prison for eight months. And one thing, and we brought him with us to Harrison, Arkansas, as well as to the Arkansas Legislative Black Caucus meeting and to our Little Rock luncheon meeting that we had that following Tuesday on March 4th, March 5th. And when he went around talking with us in his speech, he kind of reflected <coughs> on the fact that a lot of juveniles, a lot of African American juveniles, because of our parental situation and our family situation, a lot of times we don't have single mothers and we don't have a father in the household. Because there's nobody to petition us or to petition our children on behalf of the court, they're more than likely they're referred to adult court. So a lot of times, young African American youth are are moved to the adult court because they don't have anybody there to petition on behalf of them. And so it had a, a racial impact statement given before this bill was passed. They could have solved it, okay, well, African Americans, 60% of them come from single parent homes. And so that would have showed that, okay, well, this bill, this new bill would have caused a disparity with that young African American males and women and girls as well. And also one thing that Dennis Henderson had talked about was even though he spent 25 years in the state penitentiary, and so through that entire time he's gained a lot of knowledge and a lot of information, but because he's an ex-felon, he is not allowed to have contact with other ex-felons. And because he was linked up with an ex-state representative, he has access to all these resources and access to all this information that most ex-felons don't have. And so he knows how to go get a job, he knows where to, he knows how to find housing, he knows how to find this, find that, and most ex-felons can do that. And since he himself is an ex-felon, he is not able to go and communicate with these other felons to kind of help them on the way, because we all know that if you did not have the proper resources and what have you, when you come out of the penitentiary or the, just the state jail, you more than likely will recidivate and you will go back in. And so had we given an impact statement on that bill that was passed, we would have saw that okay, well, some of these ex-offenders, they do come out with a body of knowledge that is useful to other offenders. And that's just something that we wanted to highlight. And also, uh, Representative Ford, before he, before, he, before he actually enacted the racial impact statement there, he passed what's called the 85% law, meaning that if you're sentenced for uh, this specific crime, then you have to serve 85% of your time. But the thing about that is that they picked out six crimes that African Americans typically commit. So had they picked out six other crimes that, well, that's a bad example, but they picked the, the six crimes that they picked out that, uh, that is affected by the 85% law, these crimes are committed more often than not by African American men. And beforehand, this was back in 2005, so beforehand, this information was there for them, but obviously nobody went and looked at the information because had they, had, had they, had this bill been given a racial impact statement, they would have solved it, okay, well, these six laws that were, that were selecting to be served, to have served 85% of the time, the majority of them that commit these crimes are African American males. So this is one reason why this legislation is so important. Uh, I just want to make one point. Uh, I don't buy the statement that the story about, I don't buy the story that uh, was told about the reason why they, uh, uh, our children in Iowa got uh, sent to adult court versus white children just because somehow our families were more dysfunctional. I don't buy that. That's what Dennis said, but I don't buy it. Uh, and so I think that's another way that people address race because there are many people in the court system and in the prosecuting attorney's office that could have assisted, number one. <coughs> but number two, we all know, I hope we all know, that there are also dysfunctional white families. 
and uh, there are also a large number of single parent, single women, and single women families in the white community. So I think that's just an excuse that they made in Iowa, and somehow I think Dennis is carrying that forward. But I think it's the same thing with many bills. I think that they could, that they knew that was going to happen. They knew it was happening, and they could have built something into the system uh, to make sure that they were looking fairly at both white and black children. And that's the same thing with our bill, the crack powder cocaine federal legislation. They knew it was going to happen. They knew that crack was more uh, used in the black community than powder cocaine. They knew it. They had to go in. Lynn Bias, how many of y'all remember Lynn Bias? Some of y'all, some of y'all. Some of y'all got hair. Okay, Lynn Bias, right? Lynn Bias was, grad graduated from the University of Maryland. He was the first draft pick for the Boston Celtics, right? And he dropped dead on the basketball court from an overdose of drugs. Skip O'Neill, who was the Speaker of the House at that time, was from Boston. And he ran back to the House and, you know, got them to create this bill. And many of our black legislators went along with it because our communities were being rampaged by crack cocaine. So they're thinking, well, we can do something about it. You know, I'm, gonna give them, I'm not going to really give them the benefit of the doubt. I just think I spent a lot of time bad mountain. And they passed this legislation that was 101 on the assumption that the problem was what? Crack cocaine. And that Bill Lynn Bias dropped in from crack cocaine. Well, after the autopsy, he had an overdose of what? Powder cocaine. So race was undergirding the passage of that bill as well. And so I think that, uh, at least for me, I think sometimes we <coughs> go off too easy and we don't call it the way it is, uh, and we allow them to make excuses that really aren't really correct, because race underpins so much of decision making <laughs> or avoidance of actions. So with that, uh, let's open it up for questions. As I said earlier, I'm not, you know, we do want you to contact your legislator. The bill is here for you to read it. Uh, it's very simple. Uh, in the sense of what we're asking for, but we want you to read it as well. We don't want to, we want you to be, uh, we want you to be educated about it. But we need you ASAP to call your legislators, but also call members of this committee. And we're going to send you. The committee is the um, Senate, state government, and uh, state, state, state agencies and government affairs committee. Tomorrow, we're going to get a copy. We oh. have it in the packet. Okay. It's the second page to the last, second to the last page. Have the name. You can also, you know, you can also. Okay. Okay, good, because we have, okay. And we have, we, we, we were going to send it to you, but if we already have it, then we don't need to email it. We still may email it, because sometimes people don't want to deal with paper a lot, and you'll have it two different places. You'll have it in your packet, and you'll have it. So let's open it up. Comments, questions, whatever. Um, if we elect to call our elected officials, how should we frame the issue as far as what, we, what our ask? Uh, we, we sent out, and again, we'll, uh, we, we sent out an email to our uh, steering committee as well as all folks in Jonesboro and Fort Smith and Little Rock, and we'll, but we'll send it again to you. But what we're saying is here, uh, my name is Boone, and I live in Boone, Arkansas. I urge you to support SB 1093, a bill of fairness and criminal punishments. That's it. And we'll send this out to you tomorrow. Those, oh, that's what you, oh, so you, you have our email. That's what you're doing. Okay. Okay, it's in the packet that she gave you. To the second, to the next to the last page. Next to the last page, okay? So that's what we want you to say, because we don't want to get them off point, right? <coughs> we don't want to get them off point and uh, thinking that you know, they're going to make this magnificent stand for racial justice, okay, or, or not. 
okay? We're saying this is about fairness. This is about knowing, and if you get engaged in more of a conversation than that, just that one sentence, then to me what you say is, this is about you knowing ahead of time, before you pass a bill, whether or not that bill is going to disproportionately impact <coughs> racial minorities. In, in Arkansas, racial minorities are blacks, Latinos, uh, Asians, Native Americans, and that's, how, that's the racial minorities. And you don't have to remember all of that. But the, be, the first sentence is, it's about fairness. And if there's a backup, if they ask for more, then say, we want you to have the in, in, information ahead of time rather than finding out about it, what, after the fact. And because all of us know it's harder to get rid of something than it is to pass it, OK? And we know that, I mean, even with our, uh, uh, with those of you, I don't know if any of your attorneys are used to represent people in uh, criminal defense, right, as well as being a prosecutor, so well versed on both sides. Uh, but it's hard, if, if, you, if somebody gets convicted, it's hard to win an appeal. Okay, it's, it's much easier to win on the front end than it is to try and undo something that was wrong. And I'm using that only as an example of a bill. It's harder if you pass a sentencing bill that dis discriminates or is disparate against people of color, it's harder to get rid of that bill than it is, as Aaron talked about, to stop it at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. Right? To say, no, we've got to look at this at the very beginning. So it's about fairness, and that's what we want you to say. Anybody else? No. Exactly. This is not retroactive. Not many bills are retroactive. One of the big things they're doing now with the federal sentencing, the crack high cocaine law, the federal sentencing, is now there's a new one to try and make it retroactive. Most bills aren't retroactive. Most bills are prospective, right? And that's what this bill is. This bill says any bill that you introduce that affects punishment, and punishment, broadly speaking, is fines, probation, parole, term of years, death, all of that, that affects punishment, you must have a racial impact statement. And they can't prepare it, right? <laughs> the, the statement is prepared by uh, the, the uh, arm of the uh, Bureau of Legislative uh, Services as well as in consultation with the Juvenile Justice. So Coalition for Juvenile Justice. Yeah, Coalition for, uh, say it again. Arkansas Coalition. Arkansas Coalition for Juvenile Justice and the UALR Criminal Justice Department. So this is, you can't go back and scram myself and you know, just pull this and study together and show them. No, this has to go through much like your environmental impact statement and your fiscal impact statement. It comes from an agency, it doesn't come from the legislators are a buddy in Any other questions? <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, Y'all have anyone inside, you know, like, kind of tell you which way it's probably going, outcome of the bill with how they will vote? Do you have any kind of? Well, we have Cynthia Elliott, who's the one that introduced the bill, and she's been in the legislature, not the Senate, but in the legislature, I don't know, at least, what, 10 years? somewhere around in there because she was in the House of Representatives for as many terms as she could be. And now I think this is her second go around as a senator. So she knows the ropes. So we feel confident that she's aware of what's happening. We know this is an uphill battle. Now, if we're just thinking logically, right, let's just think logically and don't think you're in Arkansas or any other place in the country, I would say, not just Arkansas. If we're thinking logically, what's wrong with this bill? Just think about it. Even if you were, and I'm not some of you may be, real tough on crime, you know, even if you were real tough on crime, you said, if they steal, they're supposed to get 10 years, you should build 10 years. And don't let them out until they finish 10 years, okay? Tough on crime, right? Even with that, what's wrong with this bill? Why would this be a problem? Because it doesn't say you can't give them 10 years for stealing. It doesn't say you can't give them 
of a crime or five years or fine them a thousand dollars. It doesn't say any of that. What it says is be tough on crime, but be fair in your toughness. Know in your toughness. Know whether or not this bill will unintentionally, in quotes, impact communities of color. What, what uh, Aaron spoke about in terms of our, the 85% uh, 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 bill that they passed, and, and Representative uh, um, Wayne, Wayne Ford, thank you, <coughs> lapses, right? <laughs> young, young. But Wayne Ford said if he had known, he would not have passed it. He wasn't trying to be soft on crime, or he wouldn't have even signed an 85 percent bill. He did not realize, see, because they didn't select all crimes, right? It wasn't like they said any crime. They selected six felonies, and those six felonies were felonies that disproportionately were committed by black people. He said if he had had this statement, he never would have signed that bill. He never would have signed that bill. Anybody else? Thoughts? What's, what's going on? Y'all like my class. I got to wake you up. <laughs> Got to talk to us, you know. What are your thoughts on it? Um, you know, do you, are there any questions about it that really, you know, this is a time. And those who are maybe thinking, oh, I'm not sure I really like this, this is a time to speak up so we can answer any of your questions about that. Oh, okay, come on. If the appeal don't pass according to what we want it, is it possible they can be repealed? Bill? Is that that's a possibility? I don't, I'm not sure what you're you know, if the bill is not for, like we want to pass, right? You know, is it possible? Because it seems like if it's not fairness and that bill not passed, is the only way they can go back and go back to the legislature and try to revote and repeal that bill again? Well, if the bill doesn't pass, because that's really, as I understand it, Joyce and others. That's really, it's, it's, you can't really, this is not too much to compromise on. Because all this is is saying you need the statement, right? It's like the environmental impact statement or like the fiscal impact statement. So it's, nothing's impossible, I know that. But it's highly unlikely that they will amend and pass this bill in a way that we don't like. It's more likely that they won't pass it. If they don't pass it, as I told Judge Ross, we're just getting our feet wet, right? We're going to come back again in the next legislative session. So we know some of us have been around longer than others, but we know racial and ethnic justice is a marathon, right? <laughs> it is a long race. And so a long, we have to all be long distance runners. I'm a long distance runner. I told you I started <coughs> in 78. Okay? So we're coming back. We're not going to just say, oh, well, okay, let's just go home. You know, we're going to come back. We want to pass it this time. That's why we want you to pick up your phones tomorrow, right, and contact your legislators and contact the people who are on this committee. And just say, I mean, you might not be able to talk to them. Nine times out of ten, you won't be able to talk to them. But whoever's answering that phone is going to take down your name and take down that you want them to support SB 1093. My understanding from both state legislators and when I did a lot of work in the federal of the letting of Congress is for every phone call, they count your phone call times 300. Because they know that if you took the time to call, there are other people who have your same position that didn't call. A phone call is worth more than an email. An email is worth more than uh, 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 one of those chain letters, right? So just know that if, when, if you make that call, that your
Roll Call, you're representing a lot more than just you. And it'll be taken in that way. Okay. Yes. I have a question about the language bill. Mm -hmm. You talked about uh, filing a bill that will be significantly changed an existing offense. What do you mean by significant? Are we talking about changing it from um, misdemeanor to felony or changing the mental states that are associated with the, with the crime? What, what are we talking about there? Uh, I tried to get that taken out. Because <laughs> I'm a lawyer and I'm just the same question you asked. Uh, so it, I'm not sure how that's going to be taken. That's, 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 that's going to be problematic or not. We don't know. Uh, those are those kind of words and things that, you know, can hang you up. But it's create a new offense or change an existing offense, change the penalty, which is what we really are concerned about, which is the third one, change the penalty for an existing offense or change existing sentencing or probation procedures. Okay? So, uh, so you're saying you would admit to take out the word? I would take out some And I'll talk to Joyce about that before Thursday. We have to take it out. This is what? No, it's not the word. You don't have the latest one, so we'll have to get you the latest one. <coughs> yes, sir. What's happening on the <coughs> It's the hearing. On Thursday, it's the hearing in front of the uh, Arkansas uh, Senate, State Agencies and Government Affairs Committee, which is where this bill is. But this isn't the latest version, so we'll have to get, because I did try and take that one out. You know. Those of us who, well, you probably don't even take this long ago, the words like that can mess you up because it can be taken one way or the other way and you don't know what is going on. So in the uh, bill, the bill, I had asked to take it out and I thought it was taken out, but you don't have the latest one, so we'll make sure when we email you all. You didn't print the bill, did you? No, I didn't. Okay, we'll, we'll make sure you, we'll give you a link. How many of you can, 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 can click on links? Some people's computers are crazy. Anybody have a problem with that or need the actual bill? Dr. Arthur, if we send it to Rosemary, we'll get it out. Okay. Uh, all right, we'll get it out. Okay. 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 So all right. Make sure you send it to Rosemary. Uh -huh. uh, to, to, uh, and we need Rosemary's on our list. Okay. Yes, uh, we'll, we'll make sure you have it. Okay, so we'll get that to you, the actual correct bill. Because that was language we took out and we added some language and we took out the sentencing commission and substituted the uh, Bureau of Legislative Affairs Tax and Policy arm. Um, that's the one that does the fiscal impact statement. They would also do the racial impact statement. So, we'll do that. Any other questions? Comments? I mean, I teach from 7 to 9, and y'all fired in your class at 7 to 9. Oh, I'm sorry. See, so, I, I'm ignoring you. That's what you can do right now. Thank you for You can pick up your phone tomorrow, lunch break or wherever. I don't know if you've had different kind of jobs. Some people are retired, some people have night jobs there. But when you can, pick up your phone and call. We need you. We need to be heard. Because one of the issues is if we sit back and let legislators do whatever they want to do, then they're not representing us, they're representing themselves. They think, they may think they're representing us, but they aren't. So we have to make sure they know. Yes, ma'am. Uh, the number is in the package. And their numbers, okay? We'll send you your representative state reps and senators as well. Because even if they're not on this committee, they need to know who support this bill. You know. And since it started in the Senate, the meetings with as far as our local leader, which would be Ann Cheatham is our senator, and Sheila Lampton will be the representative. Yeah. After we call the people on the list, 
call them. And we'll send that information out too, but since you know it, those I'm people. Not make the center, make the yeah, yeah, call them because see, even though it may not be in the house yet, it's going to have to go to the house. So it doesn't matter if you call both of them now and say, Senator Elliott is going to Senate Bill 1094. You know, Senator, we want you to support it. To your representative, we want you to support it when the bill gets to the house. Yes, also, uh, if anyone would like to actually attend the committee meeting tomorrow, Thursday. Uh, on Thursday. <coughs> April 4th, yes. Mm -hmm. We will make arrangements to get them there if they would like to come okay. to the Senate, uh, to the committee meeting as well. We'll talk with, uh, well, Rosemary is probably going to be out of commission, but uh, we will make sure that the, we will provide transportation Good. for you to get there and to come back. Good. So okay. let us know. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. Good. Okay, well, uh, you have uh, our information. We will email tomorrow. We'll send you the actual bill so you can get that out. Uh, and uh, just, you know, feel free. You have information here. You can read at your leisure. Uh, uh, and, you know, so you have a better understanding and just us talking, our talking points. Uh, and if you do have any, any concerns and want to follow up with us, when Aaron sends out, based on the list, he'll put our contact information on too. So that you can feel free once you sit down and think about it. I know if you all are like me, and I think we're all more alike and we're different. Sometimes you listen to information and you think, oh, okay, I don't understand what's going on. And you get home and you read a little article or a piece of paper or you start thinking about it and say, well, what about? Feel free to ask that what about to either Aaron or myself, and he'll send that information to you tomorrow. Okay. Okay. You have anything else? No? No, um, we'd like to thank Dr. Ajahn for coming out uh, on behalf of the Mom and Self Concerned Citizens. We want to let everybody know that after this meeting, we're going to have our regular monthly meeting, uh, which you have your packet here. Uh, the packet that we gave has all of the information now, so members, please don't be, uh, because we will have our meeting. Uh, and again, uh, Mr. Bridges is going to come up and say thank you for coming out uh, for it. Dr. Osama, also we have the, um, what is it, the, um, the commission. The, uh, uh, no, the commission on, uh, we're trying to get the commission, can you even think of the name of it, right? Yeah, the the you know, Civil the Rights Commission. commission. The, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The Human Rights Commission. Can, can, you, can we talk for just a couple minutes about that so people know what's going on with that? Yeah, the, what, what we're trying to do is a group of us have gotten together, uh, we've been working together for a while, and we're trying to get past a piece of legislature that creates a, we still have to decide, some of us want a human rights commission, others want a civil rights commission. So right now it's in limbo, but basically it's a commission that will be responsible for reviewing and considering uh, things that you may have happened to you or other people that are a violation of your civil rights. And that's what we're trying to do. We are only one of two states in the country that don't have such a commission. So we're at the bottom of that list as well, okay? We're only one of two states that don't have either a human rights commission or a civil rights commission. So we're trying to get that passed. And when we get closer to that, we'll have more concrete information. It's not a bill for me. We have a draft that we're circulating among ourselves, but it hasn't been introduced yet. And we'd like to thank Rosemary for all her hard work. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Rosemary getting everybody out to the meeting and all. She called and begged and pleaded and got everybody out to the meeting. So we'd like to thank her for that. Man. Uh, just 
Ross uh, got right on it when we sent the email. Uh, she's on, uh, we have a committee that's looking at prosecutorial discretion. She's on that committee. She said we're going to work her to death. Uh, and so we, because we're really looking at this issue, this is just a first issue, first step, the legislation, which is really important. But we really want to know not only why are there the disparities, but how can we minimize those disparities. And so we're looking at a number of things. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Let's give you Wasn't that some good information? Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it was very informative. I, I enjoyed it myself. Uh, and that's what find me great. Uh, I, I enjoyed it myself. Uh, because you know that's what this uh, community group is about. It's about education and informing our community. We're gonna take a five-minute break. And then I will ready to meet the Don't forget tomorrow you're going to do what?